Okay, folks, before we get started, I want to let you know we're sponsored today by LegalZoom. If you're planning your future, LegalZoom is a must. Get real peace of mind and make sure your family is legally protected. For over 12 years, LegalZoom has been helping Americans get personalized wills, powers of attorney, living trusts, real estate documents, and more. LegalZoom also helps start and maintain businesses with incorporation and LLC filings, trademarks, and copyrights. It was built by a team of experienced attorneys, and LegalZoom takes care of you from start to finish with documents that are accepted by courts and government agencies in all 50 states. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but they can connect you to an attorney and provide self-help services at your specific direction. Take advantage of being a WTF listener. Enter Marin in the referral box at checkout for great savings on LegalZoom services. If you're a parent or an entrepreneur, don't wait any longer. Visit LegalZoom.com and protect what's yours. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck, Nicks? This is Mark Marin. This is WTF. Thank you for listening. Um, it's a pretty intense and amazing and funny and nice talk we have today. Sam Simon is on the show today, one of the co-creators of The Simpsons, former uh, writer and showrunner for Taxi, a tremendous philanthropist, uh... He's he's lived quite a life. Uh, he's he actually I think you would say has he has one life. He he won life. He retired when he was thirty five, and he's done amazing things both uh, as a producer and writer, and in as a a guy who gives back to the world. A very interesting guy. Uh, I I guess I'm uh, I'm a little stumbly because I'm trying to figure out how to frame this. And I, Meryl Marco, who was a, a friend and, and of Sam's and a, and a friend of mine, told me I should talk to Sam because he he has cancer and he he has cancer, so that's that's what's going on. Uh, he has he has terminal cancer, and that, that kind of that resonated with me in that I I wanted to have a conversation with this guy at at this point in his life because he doesn't know nor do I know you know how long his life is right now. Um, I'll explain a little more about this in just a second. Let me, let me do this. I, I do have to do business. So let me do business and, and come back to this in a minute. We're sponsored today, folks, by WarbyParker.com. Everyone wears glasses today, even people who don't need glasses. So check them out. All right. Warby Parker offers an easy way to buy prescription glasses and sunglasses online. They have a home try on program where five frames are shipped to you for free. You try them on, see which pair looks best and send them back and order your glasses right online. I did it. Uh, it was very easy. They come very quickly. They're all in nice boxes. It's a nice presentation. You uh, get five frames and you look at the ones you and you pick your frames. You send them back. You give them your prescription and boom, they come, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, and they and Warby Park has a, they have an amazing selection of frames that, and they start at only ninety five dollars. This includes prescription lenses. And for each pair you buy, Warby Parker donates a pair to charity. So for WTF listeners, Warby Parker is offering free expedited two-day shipping on the final purchase. Visit warbyparker.com for the home try-on program and enter the promo code WTF during the final checkout. Uh, again, the promo code is WTF. Enter it after you get the five frames and select your favorite pair. All right? You do that. And uh, it's it's very easy. And they, they do have some cool frames. Happy they're back as a sponsor. So now back to uh, my Sam Simon interview, which I did at his home. And that's always, uh, it, it's an experience for me. See, I don't know Sam. Uh, I, I know his work. And, and quite honestly, I'm not a huge Simpsons guy. You know, I obviously watch Taxi. But it really comes down to what really compelled me to do this interview and to, and to reach out to Sam was that, you know, he is a guy that literally had everything anybody could ever want. And he lived life exactly how he wanted to live it, and and he he earned it. And and now this horrible thing happens. This he gets cancer, and I was just, I guess, curious because you know we all have that fear. You, you wonder what what is the most important thing in life? What is really important? I mean, I go through that all the time, and I'm in this chaotic schedule right now, trying to you know show up and promote my show, promote my book. You know, these are supposed to be. You know, the big payoffs, 
for me and all the work that I've done in my life, and it's very exciting. But then as you start to really sit with stuff, you're like, well, is this it? Is this what's really important? And sometimes I don't really know. I'm not really clear. I'm not that evolved a person to, to know what is important. So part of the thing that compelled me you know, to talk to Sam outside of his accomplishments was how he's handling this. How, how do you handle cancer? You know, I, I'm fortunate I have not, I've not had to deal with something like that, and especially to deal with it at, at a young age or at the, he's, he's not an old guy. And he had a lot more years of, in front of him. And he had a lot of things he wanted to do. And he's done a lot of amazing things, you know, outside, as I said, of, of TV work. He's an amazing, uh, amazingly charitable guy. And, you know, I was nervous because I'm a self-involved person. You know, I don't think I'm going to catch cancer, but I'm afraid of it. So in some ways, you know, talking to him, you know, I, I don't think my, my drive was uh, essentially, you know, well, tell me about the Simpsons or, or what about taxi? And I'm not sure that's necessarily what he really wants to talk about now either. It was, he, we just had to feel it out. And, you know, I did not sort of shy away from the fact, you know, that he had cancer. I, I, I think I brought it up pretty quickly and we just started there. And we kind of went back over it. And, and, I, and I think in, in my own heart, I was trying to, to get a sense of what, you know, what really is important in life. And I think this is somewhat of a new search for me because I, I think that, you know, generally I'm just, you know, kind of, you know, flying by the seat of my pants trying to feel better and, and, and trying to just sort of like, you know, put myself out there and, you know, sometimes not in the greatest way. I, I don't know if I ever really sit down and ask myself, am I, you know, what's important? Am I, am I living life? You know, I don't want to say to its fullest, but that's, you know, you, you, you do that within reason. But do I know? Do I have a sense of priority or priorities as to what is important? And I would have to say no. Uh, you know, I'm a selfish, self-driven, uh, aggravated person that doesn't, you know, take much time to consider, you know, other people's feelings sometimes, uh, to consider what I've accomplished, to consider, you know, uh, you know, really to be grateful or to, to have any sense of, of, you know, happiness, you know, I have to, you know, these are all things that I'm slowly learning. So that's, that's sort of how I came into this interview. I drove out to, uh, to Malibu, that area to, uh, you know, I'm glad Sam could make the time. He, uh, you know, I pulled up and, you know, I met him and he gave me quite honestly, the best cigar that I've ever had in my life. We went into his wine cellar, a uh, cigar stash place and he gave me this beautiful giant Cohiba. And he had one as well. So if you hear that, if you hear me pulling on that cigar, that was one of my life's priorities in that moment was to not only have this conversation with Sam about his career and his illness, but also to enjoy this massive, beautiful Cuban cigar. So that was going on. So I guess what I'm saying is on some level, probably on a surface level, I was enjoying, quite honestly, one of the best things I've ever had in my life, certainly for cigars. Uh as I talked about, about Sam and, and to Sam about his life and his uh, struggle with this disease at the moment. And certainly, in an odd segue, one of the ways we deal with struggle is sex, right? Whether it's actual sex or sex with yourself, whatever, it gets you off the, gets you off the problems. It gets you a little distracted. I'm not, I'm not recommending this for, you know, for people that may have cancer, but certainly those of us who are frightened of it and paralyzed on a day to day basis need a little relief. And I'm here to help you with that. All right, Adam and Eve, adamandeve.com. I will give you 50% off almost any item, free bonus gift, three free DVDs, free shipping if you go to adamandeve.com and enter WTF at the checkout. Life is hard, life is scary, it's hard to figure out what's important, but sometimes you just got to get your rocks off. Am I right? One way or the other, I can guarantee you, however you get your rocks off, Adam and Eve will accentuate that amplify that make that a better experience adamandeve.com enter wtf at the checkout it will not cure cancer but i guarantee you it could get your mind off it for a little while let us go now to my conversation with sam simon as i said co-creator of the simpsons showrunner for taxi an important guy in television he did a lot of other stuff too i'll talk to him about that but i just want you to know that and this is not a heavy conversation but but it all revolves around where he's at right now, which is battling terminal cancer. Uh, so let's go now to my, my chat with Sam Simon. Sam Simon, I'm at your house. 
you, you look good. I've never met you before, but I was I, I know that you were diagnosed with cancer. Yes, I have terminal cancer. And we're having a cigar, and you look well. Well, um, I actually, you know, cancer is a uh, battle. I have good days and bad days. People tell me that I look great, and I don't have looks cancer. I will be a good-looking <laughs> corpse. I've always been good-looking. My noble features will not be affected by this horrible disease. But... Um, I did just get some. I was given three to six months to live six months ago. Yeah. And uh, I just got um, my scans back after six months of chemo, which is it's just so awful. I can't even tell you. <laughs> and I, right now is the best I feel because I'm a week on chemo drugs. Then I get yeah. a week off. And like over the course of that week, the last couple of days, I'll start feeling, you know, pretty good. Yeah. And then, like, Wednesday morning, I go in and I start the whole thing over again. But these scans say that my tumors have uh, shrunken. And what does that mean? I don't know because my doctor refused to explain it to me. He said, look, we're meeting on Wednesday. Can't I just do this on Wednesday? No. <laughs> well, you would, you would, uh, that's, that's what I should have said, yeah. but I, I just go, okay, I guess. So, yeah. you know, does it mean they're going to all shrink and go away? Does it mean the chemo? It's like, you know, I, I don't know, but I will accept. He told me it was good news and he told me he was very happy with it. So I'll just take his word for it for a week. Do you think about it a lot? Do you think about, like, you know, on a day to day basis, is it best if you don't think about it? Or do you, like. I would say it enters my mind every three minutes. Yeah. You think about it constantly. What is the thought? Like, fuck. Uh, it's when I. The, my main thought is because most of the time I don't feel good and most of the time I can't really do anything. It's a. You know, with, with dogs. Um, I've had to euthanize all my dogs. Yeah. People get upset that PETA euthanizes animals, but yeah. I love my dogs, and I've killed every one of them. And uh, I've done it when the time was right. And what does that mean? It means you write down the three things your dog likes the most. Yeah. And when they're, they can't do that stuff anymore, it's time to, uh, to put them out of their uh, misery. Yeah. And... One of my three things would be laying in bed and watching TV. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're you're going to hang so, on for a while. So I go yeah. like, so by that criteria, yeah. I will never be euthanized. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think like just I wish I could do something. I wish I, I can't drive. I can't do, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff. And, I, and, I, and then I just go, I, don't, I just don't feel up to it but i just started smoking pot yeah um, for the first time in your life uh like i tried it in high school and smoked a little in high school probably yeah. a few times i just never liked it yeah. i'm i'm completely for drug use yeah uh, uh I, I i don't know about that but uh i think it's a choice Pot's people right. can make and yeah. pot is certainly uh the most innocuous drug but um, if I were a pothead, I would be really happy I got cancer because everybody gives you pot. <laughs> These people come over and I had, and I should say I used to have, I didn't know how fast you could smoke that stuff. Yeah. But I used to have a whole cigar box full of little, uh, 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 uh glad snack bags full of different kinds of, uh, different kinds of pot, but it does work. And I guess as opposed to when I was in, um, High school, they've identified different breeds and strains of yeah, it's all gotten very uh, yeah. pot. It's gotten very hybrids. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's hybrids. Yeah. But the indica seems to it takes away like the anxiety and it takes away the nausea and it doesn't make it. It used to make me paranoid. I just remember being paranoid when you were a kid. Yeah, we well, have less to be afraid of right now. It's all very specific. You have Is one thing. So, so maybe I could smoke sativa. Yeah, sure, you could. Maybe I could smoke some of the hybrids. Take it all on. But, um, but I just started smoking um, pot to alleviate the uh, the no 
the nausea, and it and it works. When you okay, so like a, a guy like I have a vaporizer. That's good. You don't have to inhale the hot smoke into your lungs. They, if someone got you set up. Did I, you have I, a kid come over? Did you have a pot guy set you up? <laughs> like with the all vapor? the pot guys uh, <laughs> yeah. explained to me, this is what you do. This is where yeah. I have various delivery systems. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, I I actually because I said like I didn't I didn't know how fast you can smoke all that stuff up, and I'm going like, oh my gosh, I got to go back to the pot store. Yeah. And so I um, I found my. Uh, Jennifer went with me. See, I had a, you know, this is supposed to be medical marijuana from these dispensaries. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's classic. Yeah, it's, and, it's categorized. Uh, uh, and so I went to this one that's on, uh, it's on Pontius uh, near the 405. And I'm in the waiting room, and it's all uh, skateboard kids. You know, like in their 20s. People who are sick. Just, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, fat black people. Yeah. And, they're, you know, and one of them disappears and comes back and he's waving his thing like, ha, 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 yeah. I got a pot certificate. <laughs> that, you know. And my note was a note from uh, a rather illustrious doctor at UCLA named Dr. James Goldman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, saying, uh, Sam Simon is a patient of mine. He has terminal cancer and blah, blah, blah. And I think that marijuana may be beneficial. To his so I show this to the guy. He goes, uh, I, sorry, I can't, I can't use this. <laughs> now, I don't know what these other people had. <laughs> But you've got to go get. But the, mine was no good. You got to go get the forty dollar pot script from the pot. So doctor. that's so that's what they said. They said there's a there's another place <laughs> next uh, door uh, on Pico. Yeah. And so we go down there, and in the waiting room are the same fat black people and skateboard kids, <laughs> and they're doing the same thing. They go, ha, ah, they come out of the room. So I take my letter and I go back in, and the, this is this place was kind of downscale. Yeah. And the doctor's office was literally, which I don't mean really, really, I mean literally, it was an old mop closet, and it still had the, that big mop sink yeah. in it. And he had a, this little <laughs> tiny desk, and he had his yeah. University of Costa Rica medical school <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> certificates up there. And, you know, I gave him the letter, and for $40, I got my, uh, my pot certificate. <laughs> it's a, but you had to go to that guy. I had to go to with, that guy. With the letter from and he actually see, he's, he actually was like, oh, you know, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you know, because it's like... <laughs> what does he do? Uh, migraine, headaches, stress, anxiety. What do they usually? What do they say to get get pain? The pain. General pain. General. General. General pain. Fibromyalgia. So when you when you sit around now and reflect about your life, do, are there places you go? How far back do you go? Well, my attitude towards my life is like I I don't. I would love, I was looking forward to getting old. I thought I was going to live a really long time. And I was always the youngest sort of of my generation to do the things that I did. I was the youngest, uh, I was running taxi when I was 23. I was the youngest showrunner. I was the youngest to go into syndication. I was the youngest at, you know, all these yeah. milestones. I was kind of ahead of the, uh, you know, the, the writers of my generation and i thought well maybe i'll be the oldest actor to do this it turns out i'm gonna yeah. be the youngest to die i'm gonna be <laughs> the first one to die out of the group but i retired when i was um uh 35 and so i've lived an incredible life and you know when i think about regrets the, the my honestly my biggest regret is that I was diagnosed uh, uh, about a week prior to going with the Sea Shepherds on the um, on the uh, uh, Operation Zero Tolerance in the Antarctic, and I just think that, and I, I was so excited about that and so up for that. I had all my equipment, I had everything, and they 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 they're a anti poaching organization that uh, are the subject of the TV show Whale Wars. Right. And I just bought them a, a, a ship. So my ship was in their fleet now with the Bob Barker and the Steve Irwin and the Brigitte Bardot. The Sam Simon joined them. And Those uh, are the people that bought boats for them? 
Uh, I think Bob did. I think the other two names are honorary. Okay. Uh, I know Bob did, but I know Brigitte Bardot didn't. Yeah. 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 By the way, she's a citizen of Russia. She she uh, she made news because there were there was star there were there was some sick elephant in the in the Paris Zoo or something and I saw this was on the news everywhere. They go Brigitte Bardot. Now for you kids, Brigitte Bardot was a sexy movie star back what in the late sixties. Yeah, and she looks incredibly hideous now. Does she? <laughs> Is, she, was but, it, is it because she's tried to keep the beauty? No, hideous? no. Whenever anybody hideous? says that, you know, there's no, no, there's, there's not, there's no good ending. Yeah, the plastic surgery is, uh, you know, there's Joan Rivers and Brigitte Bardot, and you just go. Uh, sometimes it works. It's a Hobson's it, choice. Yeah. So you grew up, but you grew up in show business. No, you grew up here though. I grew up in Beverly Hills. And uh, it was Beverly Hills that was uh, a little different. It was really uh, like a small community in the middle of Los Angeles. It was kind of quaint. And, you know, we had our stars, but uh, there weren't paparazzi. And, and uh, you know, you'd see Beverly Hills, the, si- the town was very small. We'd go there after school, and you'd see Fred Astaire, and you'd see Lucille Ball, and... Uh, it was just different. Our, um, uh, uh, my neighbors growing up, were, you'll like this. It may be why you asked that question. But uh, Groucho Marx lived yeah. across the street from us. Yeah. And when I was, do you know this? No. When I was, uh, Jennifer Tilly is here yeah. uh, observing. Um, when I was five or six. Uh-huh. And I have to phrase this delicately because I, I did not walk in on Groucho Marx and my mother having sex. Right. I did walk into my parents' bedroom and Groucho Marx and my mother were, were sitting on the bed and he reacted to me by being so nervous and, and, uh, Kind of acting like he got caught. Did he roll his eyes and tap his cigar? (laughs) 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 Who's the kid? What's the kid doing here? So, uh, well, I I say like, uh, you know, like that I I heard them talking. And Mm -hmm. he was, uh, he was, uh, he said, oh, Mrs. Simon, I love you. Will you marry me? Are you rich? Answer the second question first. (laughs) And then she went, oh, my gosh, get out of here right now. He said, wait. Don't leave in a huff. Leave in a minute in a huff. <laughs> Can't you see I love you? Could I have a lock of your hair? And then my mom said, oh, Groucho, I had no idea you felt that way. He goes, really? I was going to ask for the whole wig. So that's yeah. what Margaret Dumont, who yeah. wasn't really like my mother, yeah. uh, that's what that would have been like. But uh, So that did happen, and Groucho came over to our house a few times. Was your parents married at the time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> did yeah. Did you get any validation from anybody at any point in time? Was that, was there a conversation with happen? your mother? Well, yeah. That no, what was... I was too young, and yeah. like I didn't really see anything. The the other thing that happened was uh, my dog ran away, and Elvis Presley brought him back in no. a limousine. Seriously? Yeah. Because he lived up the street. They lived. Priscilla's house was. Uh, we shared the back uh, uh, border boundary or whatever property line. Yeah. And so I guess he went up the street. He went up the hill to her house, and then. Elvis was on his way and and uh, uh, decided to drop. He was in the back of the of the of the car, but see when that happened, like when people hear that, they go, "Oh my God, a god!" Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, brought back your dog, but Elvis wasn't a god at all. Elvis was kind of a joke for uh, <laughs> for you know, like really, I think like, like the last few years of his life. You know, this was the this was the um, you know the, the uncool was it El- the late 70s? No, this would have been seventy uh, two. So he's starting to really kind of puff up, and he's he's well, he's starting special, his the- he's starting his Vegas comeback. Elvis, right. 
on tour was a movie that came out about the same time. I remember that. It was just in the white outfit. Yeah. The live concert. Yeah. But the the TV show that resurrected him, that was like in the late 60s yeah. with the black leather outfit. he did the choreography outfit. and he did Jailhouse So this Rock. is where he's starting to kind of bloat out a little it was, bit. It's, yeah. And he's like, his hair is longer now. Yeah. And, and yeah. like, you know, my recollection, because I was... You know, I do remember the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. I do remember how that changed things. I was a Beatles fan. That Elvis was very uncool. Mm -hmm. And he was like... Uh, he was old show business already. Yes. So he yes. was cheesy. He was cheesy. Yeah. yeah. So, and he was sort of like the local hill. But I mean, I'm glad he was... No, no, no. He was, he was, <laughs> here comes that southern those fella. Those damn Presleys. <laughs> yeah. What? Here he comes again with his... <laughs> with uh, the, you know, I was, uh, we're going to be... Uh, <laughs> We've got some moonshine. We got a barbecue this weekend, and we're wondering uh, there's a barbecue this weekend. There's going to be a lot of fucking, and sucking, and fight right out in the yard. What? Let's keep the kids inside. You know, what, what should I wear? Wherever you want. It's just going to be you and me. So did he die in that house? No, he no, died he in died Graceland. in uh, Graceland. Yeah, because they were still together, I guess, by, the, by when he was taken. No, not there. Priscilla. No, he was with uh, what's her face. Linda Thompson. The but star. when when he brought your dog back, he, he was with was, Priscilla. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you grew up in what was your, what, what what business was your your father? Schmata business, the rag business. He would uh, they would uh, go to Fashion Week or whatever the equivalent was. Steal all the was, designs. Steal all the designs, and uh, and in a week they'd be shipping to Sears, Roebuck, or J C. So he's a big Schmata guy. He was, yeah, yeah. So you grew up with that with, with those characters. Um. No, they they had kind of a dignified um uh business. He was he 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 wasn't he wasn't a character. No? No. I always want he those was, guys to be was, characters. No, he Did was, he start in the lower east side he, or we he lived No, 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 no. He was aristocratic. Oh. Uh um his uh my uh my great great grandfather Emigrated to the United States in the 1860s mm -hmm. to Galveston, Texas. So it wasn't the usual, you know, yeah, yeah, New yeah. York Russian Jews. Run they away. were, Run they away. were yeah. Estonian. Oh, really? So, the, so they were like with the first class of import export business yeah. people that came to the South and Texas. And yeah, well, they, they actually, my great great grandfather was shot by the Dalton gang. Really? He was a bartender in Galveston. Well, at least and it wasn't for being a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> just a bar brawl. They had no idea. And uh, uh, and so he moved to Canada to get away from the Wild West. And uh, most of the Simons are in Canada. But uh, uh, so, my grandfather lived here, and he was in the Schmata business, too. So when when did you decide to you know get into show business? Uh, I was destined for law school. Just I, you know, I think that's what my parents would have approved of. Yeah, and I just, I just couldn't do it. And so I was, uh, I was a cartoonist uh, in college or what? Uh, really, all my life. But in college, I was, uh, I, I was professional. I was uh, doing cartoons for the uh, San Francisco Examiner, single the panel, San kind of things? yeah. I was doing sports cartoons for them. And then uh, the Palo Alto, I went to Stanford, the Palo Alto Times did my stuff, and then I did stuff for the Stanford Daily, too. And I thought, well, maybe I can um, syndicate a comic strip. And uh, the head of Filmation Studios, which was a crappy animation studio, saw my uh, submission and offered me a, a job doing storyboards. Right. So I started as a storyboard artist at Filmation Studios working on just the worst. Uh, I mean, it was really awful. And so you take the, you go from, you'd read the scripts, and then you'd have to do the beats yeah. illustrated, so it wasn't really cartooning as much as it was. It's just, not only that, but you had to, um, you would work side by side with um, a book of stock footage, because everything was done so cheaply, you'd have to, pad the cartoon with you know if it was we we did mighty mouse right but it wasn't like you remember the terry tunes minor this was the new advent they did the new adventures of mighty mouse the new adventures of Heckle and Jekyll. they should have just said like the cheap crappy new <laughs> adventures because they were so they were awful but I would they saw, license them is that how they got them I mean, yeah they buy the rights right. to, them, to some washed up old thing yeah the only thing 
they did that was good was um, Fat Albert. Sure, yeah. And that was, you know, there's people that love that show, uh, but they didn't do very many of those. Back in the old days, they could just, if you had 13 shows, you could just rerun them, and kids would get older, and they'd the turnover forget was, about yeah, the them. The kids turned just, over, Yeah, right. you know, and you could run those Warner Brothers cartoons on the Bugs Bunny Hour forever, right. forever. And, and they were better cartoons than ours, and they were funnier than ours, and, was, and you'd just go, well, this... This is uh, this is the goose that's laying golden eggs for CBS. But then did that put, did that land in your head though? I mean, did you understand that on a business level early on? Absolutely. That that that, that cartoons are timeless. That they, they're gonna you know you can do twenty cart you know twenty pieces and then they can run forever. Well, that's what that's what they were doing, but that doesn't work now because there's five different cartoon networks that run. Like, do you remember like the only time? You, there was TV for you was Saturday morning. Yeah. Do you know what that must be like for a kid now that just any time of day you can turn on and you have your choice of all these different... Uh, That's right. You had to wake up early because it, you know, it started morning. early. I mean, it started shitty, I remember. There was a couple shitty ones at that 7. Was, that was me. <laughs> you know, and then you had to wait for the good ones. My brother liked uh, the, not necessarily cartoons, but Land of the Lost and those other shitty. Oh movies. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the or three stacks. They did. Yeah. They did a couple of those at Filmation. They did one called Jason of Star Command. So this is was your first sort of learning of the how to structure shows. Anyway, well, what I learned honestly that was so valuable was just through just complete naivete. I said, "Wouldn't because they made me a writer." Yeah. They said, we want you to write script. For Heckle and Jekyll? For Heckle and Jekyll. Mighty Mouse? Mighty Mouse. <laughs> Not the Cosby show. Uh, I wrote one Cosby show. You wrote the Fat Albert one? I wrote, Fat oh my God, it was, uh, you know, they had a social message, so it was like about a retarded <laughs> kid. And Bill Cosby, like the rule on the show was there's, ne there's, there's no white people at all on the show. On Fat Albert. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was just like, it takes place in a completely right. white world bill cosby. <laughs> bill cosby said what if the girl's white <laughs> the retarded girl <laughs> the retarded girl for the we'll make history on the fat albert <laughs> I, but uh he <laughs> one of the ways they tried to keep the shows fresh yeah was uh bill cosby came in one day and this was before the cosby show so he wasn't really you know, his stand-up, I don't know how you feel about it. I, I think it. it's transcendent. Yeah. I, I just go like, I don't know. I watched that Bill Cosby himself in the last few years and really sat with it. And it was like, he just decides. I fun. saw him come out and he said, I'm sorry I'm late. We didn't have a mic check. And he walked off stage and he brought a chair out. Right. And he just sat there and started talking and... I just, uh, and, and it was all kind of a theme. And it was, it was the difference between, you know, people say their wife is their best friend. Yeah. And he says, my wife is not my best friend. My best friend is this guy. And then he just started talking about the differences right. between a wife and a best friend. And he'd go off on tangents and he'd go off on some, and, and he, he kind of ended it with, uh, uh, Somehow his car broke down from the airport at three in the morning, and it was this decision <laughs> whether to call his wife or whether to call his best friend. <laughs> and he's imitating what's her name? Her name turquoise or sapphire remember. or yeah. something? I don't know. He's like, uh, he's like, what three? Do you know what time it is? You know, it was all this. All that. Take a cab. And just like uh, it, it, I just thought it was masterful. And I don't watch a lot of stand up. Yeah. Uh, I think you know I know you have really high standards and like I just think so much of it is is like TV it's just not really funny it's, well, not, it's not really rooted in character the difference between telling jokes and having a point of view right and I don't mind telling jokes yeah. either like if you want to get up and tell jokes and you tell them really well you know that's that's fine right but don't get up like You've got this take on the world, and then just do you know the uh, hacky jokes, hacky yeah things uh, you've heard before, stuff that I've heard before. Yeah, um, what did you study in college, though? Oh my God, um, I uh, 
Did you care? I mean, were you connected? No, I wasn't really a good student. Yeah. I wasn't. I, I would never have gone to. I wasn't going to go to college, but I was recruited to play football at uh, at uh, well, a couple of schools. But the only school I applied to was Stanford because they kept saying, "Turn in your stuff, take your SAT," and and so they nudged me a little bit. But uh, I, you know, I to me it wasn't a great. Uh, experience uh, and uh, I Did didn't you play go ball? to clap. No, I quit the first day. <laughs> and uh, you got a football scholarship or no? I didn't get a football scholarship. You didn't need a scholarship. No, but, you, but they, they wanted you to play ball. They wanted me to play. They knew I could get in. They knew my grades were good. They thought yeah. they had a spot for me. And um, uh, and then uh, the day before. Uh, the first practice, I saw the guy that was ahead of me as a freshman at my position in the gym. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought, like, wait a minute. Because I like playing football, but I didn't like practice right. that much. Yeah. And I just go, you know, I, f- I finally made my way to where, you know, you're kind of like a, you're treated well on the team, mm-hmm. and, you know, and then, like, I'm not going to hold bags and get my ass kicked every day. It just <laughs> so. And then the coach was with, we never, we never walk on this field. We, ne-. you know, I always had um, like authority issues and I always felt like rules didn't apply to me. I always thought I was special and I've always been kind of combative. And my whole life, I've been labeled as someone that has a bad attitude. Yeah. But now that I have cancer, all those qualities, I get unsolicited from my doctors. They go, you know, you have a really good attitude about this. <laughs> and it's all the stuff that made me a shitty person. Now, like, you know, when this, when this doctor said I have three to six months to live, uh, they did a story about it on uh, the Howard Stern News. Yeah. By the way, I tweet at Simon Sam. Yeah. S I M O N S A M. But uh, they did a Howard 100 News story about me being um, sick. And in, in part of the story, I said I was given six months to live, and that was five months ago. And a lot of people thought that meant I was going to die. <laughs> In a month. I was saying it like, I, said, I, I guess like that's why you need like emojis and you need to see a person talk. I said, I said they, they said I had six months to live. That was five months ago. Right. Like, I'm not going anywhere. Right. But Most, people thought that meant I have a month to right. live. There's the countdown begins now. Yeah. yeah. And, but for whatever reason, when the doctor said that, I just didn't believe him for a second. Right. I, I, how can you? Right? I mean, on some Oh, level. I don't know. But I mean, like, it, it's... No, I know, because some people roll up in a ball and die. Right. And I think that's a really bad thing to do. Yeah. You know, I, you know uh, uh, I, I, I plan on getting better. You know, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I'm doing all sorts of stuff. I've got the regular doctors. I've got the quack doctors. I've got... What homeopathic qu- doctors. What kind I'm, of quacks are you going to? Uh, well, I don't want to say. Um, you don't have to say their name, but the style of quackery that you've uh, hung some of your hope on. Oh, I don't want to. Because he's, he's my, I, the reason I like him. I, this doctor was recommended to me by uh, Mary Lou Henner. Yeah. And um, uh, and I should say, like the it's a brutal process and um uh it's just so dehumanizing and uh uh and discouraging and when they say it's a fight it is a fight and it's and half of the fight is with your doctors so mary lou recommended this one guy to be like my homeopathic eastern guy right and um i googled him and the first thing was quack to the stars (laughs) And I thought, that's exactly what I need. I want someone that will kiss my ass and act like they're happy to see me and be encouraging and be like a human being. Right. And so that's why I don't want to say his name because I don't don't think he's a quack. But, like, he – 
He has an MD. Okay. I, I believe you. Okay. I know, but he also says, you know, crystals are good. Yeah. <laughs> but on some he level. Does. But he on said, some I said, well, I said, Jennifer Tilly got me this giant quartz crystal. He goes, put that on your stomach. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but why I go, that? you believe in that? He goes, I believe in everything. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I mean, what? the prognosis well, is that's so the, Exactly. And that's why when I, I've, I've told every doctor, I've said, if I beat this thing, well, I, I may have been really audacious and said when I beat this thing. Yeah. And uh, I said, when I beat this thing, I'm going to write a book. And you're not going to get any credit. I'm giving myself the credit. <laughs> the credit. You were very negative throughout this entire neg- process. Well, when my um, this, you just get thrown into this. I'd been feeling sick for a long time. I went in and got some tests. I was misdiagnosed with a virus or something, but I didn't get better. I went in. They found something in my blood. Da 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 da. I had to. Uh, leave called at work you got to get to uh, for a scan at UCLA so then I got and I meet the doctor for the first time I meet him yeah and uh he shows me my scans and uh and I don't know what I'm looking at I I go whoa that's really cool (laughs) you know (laughs) he goes all the white parts are cancer (laughs) I go oh fuck (laughs) and not so cool I know and it's in your liver it's all through your connective tissues it's in one kidney uh, it's in your colon, uh, uh, and, and, uh, it's in your lymph system. And I go, I, I you know, you're a writer and sometimes, you know, the, you know, you go, you know, it's a cliche. You should avoid cliches. Yeah. But I was in the moment and I said, is it curable? <laughs> yeah. Which was my question. <laughs> yeah. So it's okay. <laughs> That's what you ask. Yeah. And, um, and he said, we don't use that word. And I went, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> like, like, they'd be happy to use it if they cured people. Anybody. People. Yeah. I go, that's not good. So I said, uh, well, how long do I have? Another cliche. Yeah. Well, how long do I have? And um, he goes, we don't answer that question. Right. And so I got upset. I said, look, you know, uh, I'm not going to hold you to the answer. I don't know what these rules are. This just seems ridiculous to me. Just as a hypothetical question, if you saw this scan on somebody, uh, you know, worst case scenario, how long do they have? And he goes, well, I suppose under those circumstances I can answer the question I would say you have between, and then his cell phone went off. <laughs> Did he answer it? And he answered it. And it was his. Can't write that thing. And it was his. Uh, uh, there was some um, confusion between him and his wife over who was going to pick his daughter up after judo mm-hmm. class. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he straightened that out. And uh, then he's, he's going, uh, where were we? <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, come on. No, but uh, what? It's real. He's did. Yeah. <laughs> Doctors can be so fucking. Well, that's what this guy is like. Did he tell you then? Yeah, that's when he said three to six months. And then what did he say? We good? No. No. Then he said, he said, "Are you all right?" I go, "What?" He goes, "Your eyes look unfocused." <laughs> and I said, "Well, yeah, that news you gave me." With your great bedside manner, that stuff you broke to me so gently. <laughs> it's a little disturbing. It's, yeah, it's a little upsetting. <laughs> because your eyes look unfocused. <laughs> what are you, I'm, well, I'm well, about to faint. <laughs> so what, what was your first, uh, what was the first gig in television? The, those cartoon shows. No, but I mean after that, like Taxi. How did that come about? I wrote a script and I mailed it in. How many seasons had it been going? Uh, that was during the third season. So it's, it's still in the middle of the run. Yeah. So you send the script in. You, you just they bought watch it. it. You watch. They the made show, it into the show. But you decided you can be a TV writer. I decided as long as I'm writing TV, I should write something I'm not embarrassed about. And, and you no uh, more heckle and jekyll. No more. No more. 
I was going to say that the things I learned, I, I learned how not to do things at the cartoon studio, and that uh, when I did The Simpsons, you know, one, you know, for example, uh, the idea, and they don't do it anymore because they don't need to, but the idea of playing the scenes out with actors bouncing off of each other, which they don't even do in the features, you know, uh, it just seemed to me so, so important to make sure we had that. And a little bit of a fight, but... Uh, you mean everybody in the same room? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, you wrote for Taxi, and then they hired you on that script. You wrote, and then you they wrote put the, me on staff. And they put you on staff, yeah. and you moved... You were already here, so you just go... You're writing... You're in yeah. the staff. Yeah. Third season. And when do you get to run the show? Uh, fifth year. And that they still had, what, three or four more years? How no, many that, was the, that, that was it? Was it? Yeah, it was fun? actually canceled twice when I was on the show, because... Uh, ABC canceled it, and then we moved to NBC, which was a big thing at the time, uh, and then they canceled us. Because I worked with Judd Hirsch. He played my dad in my IFC show for oh, two Oh, really? Episodes. I yeah. love Judd. Say hello to Judd for me. Yeah. I, oh, I don't know if I'll see him again. We did two. He was there for oh, two. Oh, you just did two? No, I did ten, but it's... You oh, know, he it's just kid. did two. Yeah, he did two as my father, and we talked to him. You should bit. be in every episode of Marin. I am in, in every episode. In my opinion. Ep- I, I am in every episode. It seems to There's me like you're... Go. I don't want to say star, but you're kind of the star <laughs> of the <laughs> show. My, my name's on it. <laughs> it's titled. But he's well, you're nice. really capitalizing on everything. Well, what do I, I, I'm 49 years old. This is going to happen. It's got to happen now. <laughs> Something's got to happen. But does it ever occur to you like this hmm? was so big for you? Yeah, oh, yeah. This is the podcast. Yeah, well, the, the one Mark has a very low overhead. Yeah. He's got, and, and, and this is not like, you know, I, uh, the, the truth is, cause I was gonna do, I do a radio show. Yeah. Outside of my Twitter at Simon Sam, uh, I do a radio show on Radio IO. I'm not gonna plug that. Right. But. I wouldn't want you to plug it. Um, what's but it on? I'm here? not going to. Okay. Oh, no, no, I don't care. Yeah. It's about, that, that people wouldn't like. It's about animal rights. Yeah. What do you mean that? Two hours, of, two hours a week where I talk Some about people would like orcas yeah. and, and uh, uh, turkey abuse and, <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. But uh, I was going to do the show. How great was this going to be? I was going to do the show from the Antarctic aboard the ship. Yeah. And I was going like, what? And, and so... I said, like, you know, what do I, you know, what do I need to do it? And they showed me like this. Yeah, that's all you need. And and, well, I needed to feed into uh, the internet to do it live. Yeah, to do it live. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was so doable, and it was like no equipment. Oh yeah, you can do anything. Yeah, it's just fantastic. So when when you were on Taxi, I mean, how crazy was it? Not crazy at all. Wait, like with Andy and Andy. That I got to say is a complete fiction. It is. Uh, well, complete. 90% 90% of it is fiction. You know, he did enjoy to put you on a little bit. Right. But that's the, that, there's a guy named Bob Zamuda. Yeah, I interviewed him. I do, a, I have a two hour, two and a half hour interview with Bob Zamuda. Oh, okay. Well, he has a vested interest in keeping that myth of Andy yes, he does. alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, he's the go-to guy. They made the, the, uh, the movie about yeah. Andy based right. on his right. book. And I, uh, Andy was completely professional. He told you Tony Clifton was him. He did. He. I mean, it's yeah. just you know. So that's all Zamuda. Uh, and a little bit of press and sure. hype. And I'm sure Andy loves it. You know, he would right. love that. You said he loves it. So is he still alive? Are you hiding? Is he no? Here? But uh, you know, at his at his uh, service. Yeah. Uh, someone got up and went, ladies and gentlemen, Andy Kaufman, and every head turned to the well, you know him. to yeah. see you know whether it was him but no andy you know i mean he was dying a long time <laughs> yeah <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> did you spend any time with him when he had cancer no no you weren't friends with no him? I, he he was i think he kept it a little secret and yeah. he was he was going to uh uh psychic surgeons and you know, really, like, like yeah. even I won't do that. Yeah, I don't even know what that is. It's a, it's like a carny thing where they oh right reach they, in, they yeah. palm a chicken liver and they yeah. reach into your stomach and that pull still it happens. Out. People still oh, absolutely. So, uh, so is, uh, when you were on taxi, is that where you built the relationship with Brooks? Yeah, 
And yeah, and we did a lot of shows together. Yeah, I did Cheers after that, and um, then uh, Jim started the Tracy Ullman show. I went to that. The Simpsons were uh, little bumpers on that. They, mo- and they mo- wanted to make that into sh- a series. And that was taken right from his panels, right? I mean, that was the first, you know, uh, animated Simpson pieces were on that show. We're on the Tracy Ullman show. And there's actually, people forget the first, not that they forget, something they never knew they can't forget. But uh, the first season, uh, it was 50-50. There was another cartoonist, I think named M.K. Brown. I'm not sure what her name was. But it was, there were two cartoon T- cartoons on the Tracy Ullman show. Right. It's like that Brian Dunkelman or whatever that <laughs> the, the co Ryan Seacrest co host yeah, yeah, yeah. on, oh, uh, on American Idol. Yeah, he does. Uh, and then they just got rid of him, and yeah. uh, Ryan Seacrest is now the most popular, biggest thing in show business. Right. Dunkelman, unsung hero. Unsung hero. He does stand up. MK Brown. I don't, I don't Maybe, remember her name. I don't know her name. Was she? It was, it was about a psychiatrist. Right. I don't, I don't remember too much about it, to be honest. So where this, did, all the Simpsons stuff, you know, this is 25, 30 years ago. Well, when did you meet Matt? How did that happen? Just on the show? Yeah, he was, doing the, he was doing the bumpers. And he was just hanging around doing those? And he, or, uh, he was one of the people selected. Uh, and I think it was Polly Platt, who uh, is a uh, – uh, well, she's gone now. Um, but uh, uh, she was a big fan of Life and Hell, so she brought him to Jim. Uh, she, she works on feet. She was a, a movie producer. Right. And so she, uh, and she was very, uh, helpful to Jim on terms of endearment and broadcast news. She's like a, uh, a muse, I think. Yeah. She was. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, she was a big fan of Life and Health, so she brought in Matt and he, uh, he, um, pitched like a family that fought each other all the time to you and jim to jim just to jim yeah and and that became one of the bumpers and it was these kids and you know the homer really didn't do that much in the in the bumpers marge didn't even have a name uh but uh there was a lot there you know Mm -hmm. and um and you were just a writer you were a showrunner at this time i was uh i forget you know, I think at the time I was just a director. I think I think when I when I started doing The Simpsons, they made me an executive producer of the Tracy Ullman show too. I don't really, uh, yeah, uh, you know. So when you met Matt for the first time, did you guys hit it off or what? Yeah, we hit it off. Yeah, we were friends uh, uh, when it started because you understood animation. I mean, it was what you started in. Yeah, and I could draw too. Yeah, you know, so like I designed a lot of The Simpsons characters. Yeah, uh, which ones? A, a lot of them. Yeah. But uh, I just Mr. interviewed Mr. Hank. Burns, most notably. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure there are people listening that are who hate me right now because they're sitting there. They're probably sitting at home going, ask them about the – and what about the – They all – the questions are all the same. And, yeah. Uh, and, and, and really, I'm not I'm – not, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to the fans of The Simpsons, and uh, I don't know why they still buy DVDs, but they do. I have a good deal on the DVDs. And um, – uh, when you say designed a character, though, what does that mean? When you sit down with Matt and, and you, you you could draw, well, you do the sometimes. At first, we would do it together. Like yeah. if there was a big scene, you, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And you're just drawing like one, yeah, sort of model of the, uh, you know. And, but when you think about it, are they fat? Are they tall? Are they short? Are they, you know, there's a lot of stuff, and it's it's pretty intuitive. Yeah, um, and. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in my office what Mr. Burns was supposed to look like. Okay. And on that, it was a fax actually, which is why it's faded so much. But on that, I it, it was a it was a very stocky kind of Edward G. Robinson gangster. Yeah. And I and I just thought right. M- m- yeah. yeah. And yeah. I just thought like no 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 that's not what this is at all. This is supposed to be this uh kind of vulture like old guy that uh you know and so i just did just off the top of my head i just drew a version of it which became literally became the model for the the character they would just take sometimes they would fix them up you know but uh but the the artists and the directors knew that they would just get a lot of 
information from my sketches. So they would ask me to draw stuff every once in a and, while. And, what, and, and in scripting it, I mean, because you were there at the beginning. I mean, you, you created yeah. this show. Yeah. What was, you know, how did you approach it that you think was different than how it was, you know, other animated things were being approached? And I mean, it seems like it was Oh, first... well, de- uh, uh, definitely we weren't doing it for kids. Right. And there, and, and um, there wasn't, even when there were primetime cartoons before, I mean, I don't know. Did grownups really watch the Flintstones? No, I don't the know. The Jetsons? I don't know. It seemed like kid stuff to me. That's when primetime started at 7. Well, the, and also the, the Flintstones were taken directly from the Honeymooners. And, yeah. Yeah. And um, Top Cat is uh, uh, Sergeant Bilko. Right. And uh, the Jetsons is just one of those family, family shows. Yeah, yeah, family show. So none of those really inspired the, the Simpsons other than that you knew you weren't going to do it that way. I made our... There, there were two writers named Tom Gamble and Max Pross. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've heard of them, but I actually wanted them to be. I, on, I only had staff for 28 days. No, 13 episodes. I only had staff for 26 days of the first season. Yeah. The rest of the time it was just me. Yeah. And I had, and I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to get Max. Cross and Tom Gamble, but they they took a different job. Well, I bet you every time they hear you say that, they <laughs> they hit themselves in the head on a show called Seinfeld. So they did. Oh, okay. they did all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so no one's complaining in that. No, camp. and they work on the Simpsons. They've worked on the Simpsons for probably five times longer than I have. But uh, we so didn't came get back we around. didn't get Max and Tom. Yeah, we got uh, uh, Al Jean and Mike Reese. And I would say to them, and then I had writers that wrote scripts and stuff. I said, We're, we, I want Max and Tom to like the show. Yeah. So they were our target audience for these two people. Why were they it? I just, <laughs> I just <laughs> like their sensibility. Oh, okay. <laughs> it sounds like a crazy thing to say, but I really did say it. And for whatever, the two writers you couldn't get, you wanted them to like it. Yeah, I wanted them to like the show. And these guys said, knew we're that gonna, we were going to do shows that Tom and Max will laugh at. Yeah. And uh, are they a tough laugh, or they it had to be smart? No, it had to not be especially. Just, yeah. I just thought if they liked it, uh, I will have done. Because my goal was to do thirteen great shows, and I used to say we're thirteen and out. We might as well make them great. Mm-hmm. And I know that that really upset Matt. He didn't express this to me at the time. If he had said, you know, hey, you know, this is really important to me. And when you say that, it makes me think like the show's going to be a failure. And I don't think it's, I would say, oh, okay. Well, I won't say, I can, I can understand. But you that. were saying that because you'd been in show business and you knew that. You the... know, most things fail. Right. And, you know, and so like, Let's just try and make it as good as we can. Yeah. You know, they would, they would say, oh, you know, this language, there's going to be children watching. And I'd say, I don't, I don't know about that. We're, we're doing our show. That's your problem. We're on right next to Married with Children, so I don't see yeah, why. Yeah, not be too squeamish. I can't say, you know, son of a bitch or yeah. something like that on right. the show. Uh, but um, but I, when, when I was saying it, I meant... Let's be free and let's be creative. Let's make it great. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, the, that was the whole, that was the momentum of that first season. Yeah, and we succeeded. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, because the show was good. Yeah. You and, know, and, 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 uh, and pretty original. So, yeah. And so you, you were there, you sort of established what that show would be. How much did Matt have to do with that? You know, once you got hold of the... He had a, he had a lot to do with it. Um, uh, uh, the the especially the tone of it not being negative, you know there was like a little married with children undercurrent mm-hmm. uh, where um, you know it's it's just it's, it's, with cartoon characters you know it's it's a little bit of a trap that it's funny that shitty things happen to them because they're just a cartoon yeah. thing and they're the lead of the show and you know but uh, uh, a lot of times Matt would go that's sour. You know, and um, and it was a really good note. 
and it really helped us because the the positivity you know they were the they were the first self aware dysfunctional family on t v mm-hmm. um but when you know but originally you know like Homer wanted to be a good father, he wanted his family to work, you know, and it bothered him that it was such a disaster, right, although it's really not you right. know the stuff that Right. Bart does that like you would like you'd be proud of him. Yeah. You go, what a kid. Yeah. Oh my God. He just <laughs> got the Prime Minister of Australia to, to what, what? I don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, like the stuff is so big, it's uh it's it's impressive. And and I uh I had a stepdaughter for a while and one thing that the Simpsons it's not a well observed uh show about parenting you know it's sort of a fantasy Mm -hmm. um and because i know the things you know i learned later in life that the things that really drive you crazy about kids or something it's just too horrible to put on (laughs) television sour sour. it's sour it's just no 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 Ah, it's just you know that's the stuff that makes you crazy and i've I've never seen that on tv to be honest right but I think because people are trying to get away from that. Yes. Yeah. So that was when he said it was sour. It just meant that it, it tipped a, a line to where, you know, the characters, you know, become. You've got to love your characters right. to have a hit show. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. You. I better you learn how to love now. myself. I, you know, if I don't learn to well, love no, it's myself. It's not so. you. It's a character. OK. Good. Here's my advice to sitcom writers. Yeah. Story above all. There's three rules. Story above all. Don't be afraid of the quiet moments, number two. And number three, love your characters. Those are my, that's my advice for young writers. And that's, that's good advice. That's the best advice ever. What, what, where do you see that fail? I mean, can you give an example of a show that... Fail? Like, yeah. No, where do you see, like, when people don't follow those rules? I mean, have you seen oh shows... Oh, my God. I mean, I know that a lot of people don't even invest much into characters or, or sometimes, and that makes a show fail. But if you've seen shows that had well, such Well, I work promise. on a show right now. I do half a day a week on the Charlie Sheen show. Yeah. Uh, I, the past 20 or so years, I've only worked on Friends shows, and I do, like, consulting. I go in, and uh, usually it's, like, for a run-through or something like that. But on the Charlie Sheen show, all they do is just sit around and and uh, bang their heads against the wall. And, uh, oh, wait, this isn't like one of those shows. People actually listen to your <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I'm used to doing stuff that nobody listens to. <laughs> no, it's, it's all helpful. Anyway, it's very, uh, uh, it, there's, it, it seems like the pressure of the, of, the, of the production on the Charlie Sheen show, which is what's called a 1090 show. That's a new thing, right? Oh, it's what is- death. I mean, what it's is just it? the end of anything being good. That they is buy you a 1090 90? show? No, I just, I'm on AFC. Well, you did, did 10. did 10, that's it. And, you know, now we've got to wait and see if they want to do some more. Oh, okay. It's old school. Well, well, the 1090 shows are you do 10 and then they pick up 90. That's fucking nuts. It's, I don't believe it's true either. What? Like, are you saying like it's this thing, <laughs> like in 40 episodes, no one is watching and it's horrible? Like... <laughs> No, you picked it up. <laughs> like you, everybody just leaves and like, come on. Well, they just, would, they just pay him out if it's garbage. Of course right? they would. Yeah, yeah. So you well, know what's going on over there? Uh, I think like um, shooting two shows a week is really hard. It's four days of shooting a week. Are they invested in it? Do they give a shit? I mean, Who? The, the, like Charlie and the crew. I mean, they think they're doing yeah. a good thing over there. Well, I don't know. They think they're doing a good thing. <laughs> Are they? Do they love their characters? Do they? Are they? Uh, I, I'm saying like the the uh, the process, the normal process of doing a sitcom. Yeah, uh, is you get a lot of chances to fix stuff. Yeah, and you know, and that's why I go. Story is the most important thing because if you have a story, Mark, and I want you to hear my voice in your head when you're you have a writer. A couple. Patriot. Yeah, yeah. We got we had four of us. There were four, four of, us. of us. And we did ten and they were all my stories. The stories were pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Well the stories uh um 
like if you actually have the events of the story are funny. Yeah. Meaning, like here's the worst example. Mark goes on a date and really hits it off with some yeah. woman. Right. Well, who the fuck wants to write that scene? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like it's just, you know, it's no. just, yeah, she's you've seen be, it a million be. times. What is it? She's going to laugh at some shit yeah. you say. Yeah. And da da da, and then you're gonna go to your best friend. And you go, oh, it went really well. I yeah. really like. She's smart and she's funny. Yeah, and she's <laughs> that's yeah. what they always yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but so like right away, I and the Charlie Sheen show is a lot of of dating and like I I just you know, and then it's so you're saying it's hard to avoid being hack, being familiar certainly. Yeah, if not. So, but like if you've got a story where this happens and then the person decides to do something about it and that goes screwy and you can pitch it and you're not pitching the lines from the show. Right. You know, then, you know, you have a good story. Right. Right. If you can like just a story, you, know, you tell your friends about right. something that happened. Right. Where the events go a place you didn't. think. Well, they would I go. always that's 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 a that's a thing that I feel on that show. It's like these guys went to comedy writing school and I guess I don't know, you know, I don't know how to do a story because to me, a story is like where something happens and something else happens and that makes something else happen and that makes sense. And I'm happy at the end of the show that we're being sued by, uh, um, by, uh, the screen extras guild. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, uh, one Simpsons, they they the the Walla group. Yeah, they worked in the first scene and they worked in the last scene, and they went to their union and said these are two se separate shows. None of you know they they tried to hire us for one show, but they put us in two. Yeah, because they said there's no way this could be the same episode of the show. And I said, well, no, we got an act two. Yeah, we weren't trying to, <laughs> you know, we weren't trying to cheat you well, but to me that's a compliment yeah but this they feel that um like if charlie uh if charlie wants to go on a date first you need to do a scene where charlie laments how he can't meet a nice, <laughs> a nice girl right right then you've got to set up who the girl and then you to, and it's just like i uh i don't there's no story. It's all set. I don't get up. Yeah. Well, with The Simpsons, you could do whatever fucking – you could take anything. With animation, you could take it to any limit you want. There's no limit. That's true. And when – what happened – how many seasons were you there? Four. And what happened there? What, what, how, was the, how was the breakup? What, what, why did you leave? Uh, I left because I wanted to do my own stuff. I didn't especially like it there. I was being asked to do things that I wasn't good at, which means – uh, I was supposed they they hired a bunch of other writers to do three uh, on air shows at ABC. Yeah, and I I just uh, they they were uh, I I just you know I wasn't full time on the I wasn't going to be full time on the Simpsons. Yeah, and I wanted to do my own stuff, and I had a great. You know, technically, I was never fired from the Simpsons. I still earn. Uh, a salary and a, uh, and I kept all my points in the show. Yeah. And um, so to me, it's uh, uh, was really a. Um, I mean, it's not remotely a regret. Right, yeah, but there's no there's no bad blood anywhere. I don't think so. I see Jim once in a while. Yeah. I don't see Matt very often, but we just don't travel in the same. Right, circles. right, right. So that, so then you went and you just did other stuff. I did, but I also didn't, you know, but The Simpsons quickly went into syndication. Do you think it hurt the show? Well, I think it's tough to be on for 25 years. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's got to hurt the show. But it's been such a training ground for amazingly talented people. I mean, like, like it's, well, Dana Gould was there for years. Oh, okay. Conan O'Brien was there. Conan O'Brien. Dana's yeah. a genius. Yeah, well, um, no one from The Simpsons has created a hit show. Why do you think that? I don't know. <laughs> you don't have any idea? Uh, because, for one thing, running a show 
is not the same as creating one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that, you know, it's, uh, you're walking into set characters. Yeah. Set, uh, there's a method it's to it. Completely well established and they've got all the money in the world to hire people. I think there's two teams. I don't think everyone even works on every episode. I don't know what, the, I don't know how they run the show now, but I think it's like a, it's a machine. Evens. It's a machine. It's a, it's a fantastic machine. Yeah. That employs lots of human beings. Yeah. D but yes. But do you, is, do you th like a, does it sadden you at all that it became that? You don't no, care. No, it pleases me. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a money making machine for exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, if I had to watch it to cash my checks, I would. <laughs> If the bank said, now last Sunday, yeah, what happened to Bart? Yeah. I would, I would go, oh. <laughs> I know exactly. I watched. <laughs> yeah. But by the, after four years at The Simpsons, when did you know you could retire forever? Probably like a couple years later. That's when, that's when uh, the big checks started coming in. And you were like, why not? Fuck it. Well, I, I never, I don't know why. Like, d don't. I can't fathom what makes Jim Brooks work so much. I, I don't know why people work when they're when they're rich either. To be honest, I, with I, I, now, now I could see like if you were a doctor, saving lives, saving lives. Yeah, or you were, I, you know, I don't know. There's lots of things, but I go this. You know, there's, there's just not the real need for right. it or something. Right. And 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 uh, I would just rather spend my time doing other stuff. And I've had lots of adventures, and I've been able to do lots of things. It's crazy what you've done. Most people don't, you know, don't, frankly, have the time and then also the money to do. So you, you, I, to me, like I beat the system. You won life. Yeah. And when you got when you retired, what was the first thing you did? Well, uh, one of the first things I did was I started my foundation, yeah. which um, I'm really proud of the stuff we do, but I work, also work with other organizations. and For the animals? Uh, no, I don't just do animals, Mark. Okay, this, is, this is a stereotype. It's not a bad one. Well, some people think it is, and I'll tell you, like uh, animals and the environment get 1% of charitable donations yeah. in, in the United States. And, uh, uh, and, and people that come up to me and go or, or on Twitter at Simon Sam, they go, uh, why don't you help starving kids? And you go, well, first of all, I, I do that. I have a long relationship with Save the Children. I've been on and off their board of directors. Uh, we have the Sam Simon Challenge Fund every year. So, I mean, I do, not only do I do that, I go to Africa and I look at those kids and interact with them. You do? Yeah. And so I also, in LA, I have the Sam Simon Foundation Feeding Families Program. We feed 200 unemployed Los Angeles families a day. Families a day. I pay for all that myself. And I'm not saying... That and then I tell people that. They go, oh, my God, that's fantastic. That they like. Yeah. They go, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I go, and it's cruelty-free vegan food. They go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, what if the people aren't vegan? And I go, well, then I guess they can go to your food bank. <laughs> <laughs> when did you become a vegan? Uh, I've been a vegetarian for close to 40 years. And it was, it was, and is I, it, I gradually evolved to, you know, when I found out about the horrors of dairy farming and there's no free, you, 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 if you, if you really want to be pure, but, uh, but listen, anything somebody wants to do, if they want to just do a meatless Monday or something like that, it all helps. But is it because it, like you at some point and the people at the food bank, they don't sign anything. They can eat all the meat they want. I'm yeah. just not going to pay for it. Right. But, but it's it, groceries. But at the point that you, at what point did you feel the pain of animals? I mean, wh what made you go to... Oh, always. Like, you, like when you were eating meat at some point, you were like, this is... I just don't want things to die so I can eat stuff. You can feel the pain of it. 
Well, I do believe, you know, they, they go, some animals, now this is going to sound really crazy. Yeah. Um, I believe there are some species of animals that are more intelligent than people. I just think we look at them and, and, uh, from a human perspective, we, from a human perspective, and they don't realize in 14 million years they've evolved to communicate in ways we can't comprehend. Just cause, just cause they can't service our food, we don't feel bad about eating them. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then on the whole, animals are far more intelligent than, like, they, oh, a chicken can run around with his head cut off. Well, maybe a chicken can, but that doesn't mean a chicken is stupid. <laughs> I mean, I don't, th- I, you know, chickens can problem solve. They can, this is all propaganda from big farm companies yeah. and factory farming. They want you to think there's nothing wrong with, and, you know, the Bible is another big problem because yeah. it says we have dominion over right. animals. Sure. And people use that as an yeah. excuse for everything for corporate we do. corporate farming. Ugh. Do you believe in God? No. <laughs> no. No, I think that... Uh, and, and religion has changed a lot in my lifetime because it used to be sort of a message of tolerance and religions used to work together right. and, it was, and the Bible wasn't meant to be taken literally. And it's like, I don't know how you can take that book literally. It's the craziest yeah, bunch of ridiculous. nonsense. Yeah. Ever. We watched this, this movie called um, The Bible, directed by John Huston. Oh, the old, yeah, the, movie, the big movie, right? Yeah. They attempted to show Noah's Ark, this boat that they stocked. And you just go, it's the most preposterous thing. When you, by, by showing it, it exposes it. They're rebuilding it at the Creation Museum. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. They've got every, one of every Prepar- species. Preparing, yeah. And one of every species. They, if species you that, actually read Genesis, one, the, in one paragraph it says seven of every species. Hmm. And then just a couple paragraphs later it says two of every species. So <laughs> there's holes all the way. No, it's ridiculous. There's holes all the way through it. And, um, and uh, uh, the idea of there's a concept called human exceptionalism. Yeah. Which... which you know, we are the only creature that, and you know, they made up a whole bunch of stuff when I was a kid, but we found out that animals make tools, animals understand death, animals communicate, animals, you know, they, they do just about everything, but they certainly suffer equally to us. So forgetting intelligence, forgetting, you know, uh, uh, how man makes art and all this you you know when you when I look at an orca in, in a little uh, bathtub at SeaWorld or when I see a cow you know being hung by its leg for slaughter at a factory farm, I just go that's misery that's suffering, and that should stop so I'm trying to do what I can to accomplish that in the next six months. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you did a little The clock is running. Well, do you ever think about you? You have kids? No. Like when, when, and if you pass, is most of your what you have left going to go? Uh, I've given most of it away. Yeah. Yeah. I won't be rich until um, we get our quarterly uh, <laughs> Simpsons check installment from the <laughs> from the Simpsons, but. Which building? Peter's, Peter headquarters is in the Sam Simon Center. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I, I get honored like crazy now because people think I'm going to die. Yeah. Yeah, I got another. I get. I love getting honored, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fantastic. And getting things named after me. And, yeah. And, yeah. yeah uh, uh, the Museum of Broadcasting called and they said, you know, we, won't, we, we had you. We figured you'd be doing an archive interview for us. Uh, would you mind if we did it now instead of... <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, no, feels a little pressing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, know, like, you know the subtext. What's, what's is, an archive interview? What we're doing right now? Oh my God, I wish. Uh, Would they have specific questions relative to specific? It was very dry. Yeah, I couldn't. No, I, I wasn't like real episode happy with by it. episode for Taxi or what? Yeah, the, I, they they were asking all this stuff, and it's just so long ago. I don't know. Like, I, I really, you know, I don't think much about the. 
even the Simpsons or, or uh, uh, but certainly like Taxi and stuff, that's a long, that's a long time ago. Uh, the one cool thing was you can, um, when you're talking, you can say, this is for the time capsule. Yeah. <laughs> and you can badmouth anybody you want. Oh, really? Yeah, I, well, that's the way I took it. Well, so, so they would set well, it up like that? You're, you know, this, we won't play this. You can tell us when we're allowed to play this. If oh, you really? Want to, you Throw know, some people under the bus. Yeah, if you want to say, like, when, uh, when Jim Brooks dies or when you die. Oh, really? Did you have a lot of that? I, didn't, I did one, and I said, put that in the time capsule, and then I said, no, cut it out. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? What? Why did you take it out? Because uh, I was doing it, it the, the, the interview was very dry, and mm. uh, I wasn't, so I was really just trying to get my juices going a little bit. <laughs> And, I was, and, the, and the person was just like side venom, like, yeah. you know, uh, and I just thought like, oh, what the fuck? Yeah. Not, why should I bother that person at some point? Yeah, I guess you, you got to let it all go, huh? Yeah, I wasn't really feeling it. Yeah. I was just going like, I'm just going, and then I did, yeah. and then, and then, uh, and uh, you st what about the poker thing? How, when did that uh, be, that just became a, an obsession, or how that? Um, well, my ex-wife is an uh, outstanding uh, poker right, player. Yeah, She's probably yeah. the most successful woman tournament player of you all love time. It? You love it? Yeah. She'll play right now. She'll play poker like she just loves to play poker. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Do you want to play hundred dollar <laughs> freezeouts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no good. I don't know how to bluff. You can learn how. I am can, such a mark. You I can mean, learn how in, in, in uh, I'll teach you. five minutes. Yeah, she'll, she'll teach you. Yeah, that's a good instructor. But um, there was a thing called the poker boom. And uh, there were two things. There was the, the, these kids started, that figured out the game. Uh, started winning these big tournaments, like the World Series of Poker. Mm -hmm. And that got people thinking like, oh my God, anybody can learn, which is completely true. And it's like, you know, when you watch golf on TV, you could never play golf like Tiger Woods. Right. But you could watch poker, in a year you can be as good as, <laughs> as those people, especially in tournament poker. So, you just so that's real attractive because you get to compete on an elite level and sometimes win. Yeah. Uh, so it was the competitive aspect of it? Yeah. yeah. And also, like, um, a lot of the things I do outside of TV, I like that I'm just getting car. I like that it's not, there's right. nothing I can bring right, right. to the table and, uh, you know, no and character get a sketches. favor yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or, or, uh, uh, it's pure. Yes, it's yeah, pure. Yeah, yeah. And what about the boxing thing? Uh, that started as a similar thing. I was working corners. Um, for years, uh, that, what does that mean? You were in the training, you were in the, uh, I would just, um, you know, help God. I was, uh, uh, I was training and competing in boxing in like, um, I would fight in like gym shows and uh, yeah. bucket of blood, uh, like amateur nights stuff, which is, uh, Kind of, kind of rugged, but a lot of fun, you know. And um, and so, you know, the gyms I was working at, you know, they were professional. There were professional fighters. Yeah. And uh, I was friendly with the guys, so I would be one, not the main trainer, but an assistant in corners. And I liked that people didn't know who I was, and that if I needed to get something done, I had to figure out a way to get it done. If the stupid kid left his trunks at home or something like that would try and figure out a way to make it work so i like being tested that way and in terms of like well you two seem to get along you were married you're not anymore you've done all right with that yeah that's good yeah i don't know how you do it well it's not i don't do it she does it oh, okay <laughs> that's all her ability yeah so when it, and when you look back on everything what what do you think is your if, the 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 best? What are you most proud of? Um, 
You mean like it's a legacy? Sure. Uh, In any way. When you're like, all right, so what did I do? Well, the totality of it is really interesting because there's so many different things. So I kind of like that um, when people talk about me, they talk about me as a special person. Mm. <laughs> Which usually means, like, I, I mean, I know I'm a border, like, I would be a nut if I didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> Because I would be doing, <laughs> you'd be special the in the same, wrong way. I would be doing the same stuff, but I'd just be ranting and raving, and and uh, I wouldn't have access to the to the uh, the, the people and the uh, the ability to. When they honor me, they're honoring me for check writing. Yeah, I'm <laughs> one of the best check writers. I know. Yeah, like, this check, I, like I've, when they do a statue of me, it should yeah. be with of you writing. <laughs> Like Robert Graham did Joe Lewis, the yeah. Joe Lewis monument in Detroit. And yeah. It's just a giant yeah. 20 foot fist. Yeah. But it should be me uh, <laughs> with a, a check. big pen signing a, a check to PETA. <laughs> One of the greatest check writers of his generation, <laughs> this guy. I remember once we needed some money. Yeah. And we were just up against it. We didn't, and then Sam. God damn, if he didn't take out his checkbook. I'll what a, never forget. A hero of just, check writing. And he just filled in, paid to the order of, and it's just magic. <laughs> then our problems were over. Well, I, I hope you get to ride on that boat. I do, too. I think it's possible. It would have been 77 days That's in long. the Antarctic. Is it which up there? Is Are they the, doing it? Is it happening? They just finished it. How'd it go? Great. They save any whales? They saved uh, uh, probably 1,200 whales. Oh, my God. That's great. Yeah. And they sent the Japanese running. Is it armed? They're armed. The Japanese? We're not allowed to be. Oh, really? They throw concussion grenades. They aim guns. They aim water cannons. They ram the ships. We don't do any of that. And yet... Uh, the U.S. government uh, seems to have turned against the Sea Shepherd Society and has uh, uh, issued a number of decisions and not gotten involved in some real injustices in our society, and it's all because government is so corrupt. They're whores. They're, they're just whores. They're, the, the government's just a money laundering system for corporate well, interests. Well, if... Uh, uh, if I were to have, uh, you just said the government is just a money laundering system. And if I took you back through the last uh, year and a half of Sea Shepherd court cases and all that stuff, your reaction would be the government is just a money laundering system. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so I'll spare you yeah. <laughs> all the legal briefs. But that's exactly it. And uh, um, uh uh, uh, one of my best college friends is currently the ambassador to Japan. I called him up. I said, can you help me with this? You, you know, da, 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 And they just, Japan. what, they just, they illegally kill whales. They do, the yeah. But, um, but they prosecute the sea shepherds for crimes that they don't really commit. Mm. And, um, uh, and so I said, you know, is there anything you, he goes, look, I'm on your side. Uh, uh, I completely agree with you, but there's nothing I can do. And you go, well, why is there nothing you can do? Yeah. You're the exact right person to do something. Like I just by some crazy quirk of fate, I happen to be friends with one of the few people on earth that could actually constructively engage this problem and do something. This is a guy that got the Pacific Fleet to stand down during uh, uh, the Fukushima power plant disaster. So he could do something. He could do something. It's politics. Yeah. He's got a career ahead of him. Yeah. 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 So what's your what's what's the biggest fear that you have for the for the future? That oh my God, I just think it's I, I think it's very bleak. Yeah. Uh, I think people have to wake up and start getting involved because you're you're losing as an American. 
uh, you are losing your rights. I think America is uh, is uh, the worst version of it that's ever been, and I just don't see how that can get better. I just think there's so many mm-hmm. um, problems that are uh, absolutely intrinsic to the way this country is right now, uh, and uh, so uh, that's that's awful. And uh, and then I think the environment is, uh, I mean, it's too late to do anything about climate change, but we don't know what that means. And I think it means big cities on the eastern, you know, outside of the fires and the droughts and the tsunamis and all this other stuff. I think for this country, it means we're going to start getting hit by these hurricanes in ways that we just won't have the time or the money to fix stuff back up, which is true in New Jersey and it's true in New Orleans. They yeah. still haven't yeah. fixed, you know, brought that back. Um, and so, like, the first time a Category 5 hur- hurricane hits New York, that's it. Yeah. Where are people going to go? I have no idea. What are idea. they going to do? No, it's really scary. And then you go, there's there's no manufacturing here. What are jo- there, There's no middle class here. We manufacture assholes here. Yeah, we do. <laughs> We're one of the, the the world's leading manufacturers of assholes. No, it's true. <laughs> uh, it's funny. I was talking to uh, uh, the, 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 that guy that's ambassador to Japan. He's got this one daughter that's like she's um, she wants to be a nurse. She wants to be a nurse in Africa with AIDS patients. She wants to. I go well. You know, that's fantastic. That's having a purpose. In life, and it's the most noble thing. I go, what does your son do? They go, he's an investment banker. <laughs> so I go, oh, so you have one child with a conscience. <laughs> I actually said, like, t- like that wasn't a diplomatic thing to say. Right. But I said something else. I, I, I said, you guys. I was talking about the Japanese. I go, but you guys. He goes, hey. Don't say you guys, but <laughs> I'm on your team. But he's not. Yeah. He is on their team, right? But well, I shouldn't have saying, said that. That's, that's just a job. I shouldn't have said that. To maintain, uh, you know, the 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 the, the diplomatic communication. I could tell he got upset when I yeah. I, I lumped him in with the Japanese whalers. <laughs> did he? Did, are you guys okay now? Um, I sent him an email. Yeah. I said I really think you can help this. Think of it as the last request from a dying friend. And he sent back, I hope you get to go on your ship one day. Which is (laughs) non-response. And also, like, you can help me get back on my ship. <laughs> Good luck with everything. You could, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. like, his, again, it was that thing where he's like, I don't know why you're coming to the ambassador of Japan about a problem between Japan and the United States. <laughs> 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 so I thought that was a really... Dismissive and... Uh, it's just not acknowledging that he could help. Well, I do it's hope like you... Like, that it's a wish one day. Yeah. I do hope you get to go on it, and I hope you live a long time. And thanks, thanks for talking to me. I plan to. Okay. I had a lot of fun. That's our show, folks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. It was it was heavy, but I thought lighthearted and 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 you know, actually uplifting. You know, he's fighting the good fight. He's still enjoying life, and he's had an amazing one. Uh, I have to run, so I'm not going to ramble on too much here at the end but go to wtfpod.com get yourself some justcoffee.coop i got a book event coming up where is that look at the calendar will you i'm going to be in san francisco tomorrow night friday uh so i'm at the jcc in san francisco for sketch fest so if you want to go to that i think there's still tickets i don't know everything's very harried right now so i'm gonna go okay all right Boomer lives!